One of the things that would probably be useful for our viewers or people interested in this trip is who the people were and how we got together. The, uh, uh, I think that, I think the prime, check me on this, Jeff, but the primary, the first thing that happened was that you and Willard got together and were kind of talking right. about this and right. doing some traveling afterwards. And then Willard got engaged to Virginia Loudon, another person in the Peace Corps, and they decided to get married. And Virginia was going on a trip, so it, now it was a trip of three people headed to East Africa. And I was Jeff's roommate at this one school in Afwas, this agricultural high school, and I was watching this whole thing start to develop out of the corner of my eye, and my mouth was just drooling, man, would I love to be on that trip like that. And once Willard got engaged to Virginia, I thought I saw an opening. I said, uh, hey, those two are gonna be together. Poor Jeff is gonna be all by himself. He <laughs> needs company. Uh, so I uh, decided to make a proposal to the three of them to ask if they would let me join the trip, but I knew I had to offer something to them for the uh, hassle of having a fourth person on it. So what I did was try to think what I could what I could bring to it, and I and I, I suggested two things. One, I was halfway decent with languages. I, I'd studied French in college and knew, had learned a little bit of Arabic. We knew Farsi, which carried us through parts of Southwest Asia. So I said, hey, here's the deal. If you will let me join this trip, of course I'll share in all the costs. Uh, I will be the translator uh, if, uh, whenever we need to do that. And secondly, and this is a role that has lived, lived with me for the rest of my life, a label that has, I'll be the expediter for this trip. And basically what that meant was when we had paperwork, I had to deal with officials, I would be the one that got the passports and filled out the applications for the visas and change money and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and they said, wow, that's a deal. I don't know if they said, wow, that's a deal, but said maybe that's worth letting the uh, hassle of having a fourth person on it. But uh, so it became the four of us then, and like and that started out again, like I said, with the uh, uh, goal of going to East Africa, seeing the game preserves. The other thing that then happened was uh, people in the Peace Corps are fairly well read. I'd say that's a f accurate description, at least of our group, and they knew that when you're in East Africa, the Nile you know, comes down from Egypt, or I mean it goes up to Egypt, but it separates just an, above East Africa into the Blue Nile and White Nile. And they knew that that was where a lot of English colonial history had happened. And they said, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we could go from East Africa, Kenya and Tanzania and so forth, up the Nile River and see all those historical sites? And everybody said, yeah, that would be neat. And then the question was, how would we do that? And then the only way you can do that in East Africa, at that time at least, was with a Land Rover station wagon. That's, that was built for those kind of traveling conditions. So that sounded good. So we said, well, okay, let's do that. Well, and maybe we can buy a used one in East Africa and we'll drive up the Nile to, uh, to Egypt. And then we said, well, geez, if, if we're in the Nile and we, and we got a Land Rover, why don't we keep on driving? And we, well, that sounded good. And then we said, well, if we're gonna do that, why don't we just go to England and buy a new one and drive it to East Africa, up the Nile, and then go on east? And that's what we did. Uh, so it just expanded from small to bigger, 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 and like I say, from a relatively short trip to a 12-month, to a uh, year-long, amazing world expedition. It was, it was interesting. Uh, Will was uh, remarkable. Yeah. Um, he was uh, this sort of a... Renaissance man, he was an artist, he was a rancher, he was a pilot, he was in, involved with the Nature Conservancy, he was, um, just had these multiple facets, uh, really quite a remarkable person. And um, so it was, um, it was interesting from my point of view, is um, I'm, I'm sort of helpless. I mean, I, <laughs> knew quite a bit about the, the geography and the archaeology <laughs> uh, and the history and so on. Uh, but we really needed our expediter. <laughs> and Will was also an yeah. incredible problem solver. And he could do things beyond make peanut butter and mayonnaise and stuff, <laughs> which he which would could do. do on a regular basis. Um, but he... Um, was really, uh, he knew mechanics, mm -hmm. he kept the Land Rover going under difficult circumstances, and as I went over the, the materials with regard to our travel, it was just amazing how, how the transmissions we had to replace, and the flat tires, and the, 
uh, all these these various things of keeping the Land Rover um, viable, uh, functioning, replacing axles in the and, middle of the desert. Yeah, and <laughs> and um, yeah. and we have axle stories that we'll, we can tell later. We we'll talk about Zidane. Uh, but it was it was it was really um, he was he was quite remarkable. Uh, <coughs> um, Virginia, I know a little bit less about her background. She had studied at Kent State and um, it's from Cleveland, I think, right there, right? From Ohio, certainly. Yeah. And um, and so she um, uh, was was able to add dimensions to the trip that that we men were unable to. In terms of, of relationships, for example, when we broke down um, loss and axle and so on, uh, she was able to um, spend time with women, the the Sudanese women, and um, and extract from that experience uh, information that we, as men, were probably unable to to um, extract. So it was it was an interesting. Uh, group of people, I think. I think that we were able to extract maybe a little bit more information uh, from the trip than it had we just put four Americans in Land Rover and sent them to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it was um, really really interesting, and and I think that uh, we were able to extract information from the trip that that is. Um, maybe a little unusual for a trip of this kind. What, one part that may, might add to that, uh, during the Peace Corps, uh, most of us were right out of college, so we were 21, 22, right in there. Uh, Willard was the one guy who was a little older than the rest of us. He'd already been in the military, you know, I think he was in his, what, mid, -thir mid late 30s or something like that. And so he was always regarded in the Peace Corps and on our trip as the sort of the, the senior uh, person and the sort of the leader, uh, well-deserved, and he didn't have to work at it, but we just all saw him as the, the, the father figure, maybe is another way to describe him, and, uh, but, but with all these incredible capabilities. Yeah, yeah, he was 36 uh, when he entered the Peace Corps, mm -hmm. and we were in our 20s. Okay, as um, indicated, we had left where we would served in the Peace Corps in Iran, and uh, we're traveling across Turkey and so on. Uh, and it was so interesting, the contrast between Iran, where we have these beautiful meadows and mountains and so on, and as we entered Turkey, we could see Ararat up to the north, Mount Ararat. And then got to Azurum and taking the train across, and it wasn't a matter of, of buying a ticket and boarding the train and moving moving to the <laughs> west people were coming in through windows and doors and pushing and shoving <laughs> it was just the most chaotic it was a wonderful uh, sort of an introduction to chaos <laughs> and uh, then we we traveled and and we were invited to the same chaos with officials very often um, and trying to i think maybe explain ourselves as, as we were traveling across, um, especially the transition from uh, Turkey to, to Greece. And um, then, as, as uh, Diaz mentioned, traveled across by ferry to uh, Brindisi. And <clears throat> as we we're traveling uh, through, the, through the Aegean, uh, we could see uh, uh, Albania up to the north and at that time Albania was mysterious and not well known and it was um, of course it, it was politically aligned with with China at the time and this was during the Cold War and communism and so on and it was it was just enshrouded in clouds and so on <laughs> and it just seems sort of like that's what it should be like <laughs> you know and uh, it uh, <clears throat> so we went on to um, on to Italy and when we uh, had gotten to Italy, and we were trying to of course travel as cheaply as we could, and minimize expenses. So we were hitchhiking through Italy from that southern hill on up to uh, Florence here, and one night we got to a place and we just didn't know where we were going to stay. We didn't want to cough up the money for 
paying for a nice lodging in, in Europe, and we knew those were expensive. Mm -hmm. So what to do when we were, it was getting, you know, the hours were getting on, getting along six, seven, eight o'clock. And finally what we decided, we were walking, literally walking along the road, and, and we, it was that time of year where the corn stalks, uh, I think it was corn or wheat stalks, I'm not sure yeah. which it was, but mm -hmm. kind of stacked up there. And we looked at that and said, well, you know, probably the, better than just sitting out here on the road all night or laying on the side of the road, let's go sleep under those corn stalks and at least to be semi-warm. So we did, so along about eight or nine o'clock, whatever time it was, we went out, each got under different stalk, unloaded our stuff, crawled down under, it was halfway warm, and uh, slept all night, got in the morning, kind of shook ourselves off and got up, got on the road and hitchhiked further on up. But so uh, one of the things Jeff and I had fun doing was spending a night under the corn stalks in Italy. <laughs> Through Italy and, and cornfields and so on things that, that Dee has, has mentioned. Uh, we only did that once, I yes, think, but, yeah, but it was um, interesting. And then uh, dealt with the antiquities and so on of, of Rome and um, this small Austin Healy that with high crowned roads just sort of scraped its way. Yeah across Europe. But now you got to tell them first how we got to the Austin Healey and how the, the challenge we had of linking up with Jim and his newly purchased Austin Healey. Yes, and that was um, making our way to, through the antiquities and so on of the, the region, um, to uh, Florence. And there it was a matter um, also of meeting Jim at the at the Statue of the David. And um, I, I think that the area is replete with statues of, <laughs> of the David. See, well, the problem yeah. was that we had agreed with Jim, the three of us, before we left, how to meet in Florence. And we said, well, we'll meet you at a certain day, at a certain hour, at noon, I think it was, at the foot of the Statue of David, thinking there was only one. But when we got there, Oh, uh, there was more than one. <laughs> like three very well-known ones and... Uh, and um, uh, so finally we were able to to get together and <laughs> uh, went through sort of Western Austria, Switzerland, um, France and, and um, as Dee had mentioned, to, to Belgium and then on to England. One of the other interesting things that happened to Jeff and I happened when we first got to London on our way to um, meet Willard and Virginia in England there. We got to London first, so we, we were on our own for a night or two. And again, we were trying to figure out how, what to do for lodging in an expensive city and how to do that cheaply. So we decided to go to the YMCA. And uh, it was a, a lesson in the serious challenge that can be offered by regional dialects. So again, uh, me being the expediter and a little more outgoing than Jeff. Uh, so we, we, we come to the, the YMCA and we go up to the desk and so I go up to it and I ask the guy there, uh, do you have any rooms for tonight? We got two of us here to like a room. And we're in England, same common language, English. And the guy, jabbered off something and I listened to it and did not understand a word he said, not one. I had no idea whether he said yes or no. So I paused a minute and said, well, how do I deal with this? I said, uh, excuse me, could you, could, could you tell me again, do you have a room tonight? And he rattled off something again. Ken, no clue whether we had a room or not. I said, excuse me just a moment, I, I need to go talk to my partner here. So I went over to Jeff and I said, Jeff, I need for you to come over here. I, I, I don't know what this guy is saying. See if you can figure out what he's doing. So we went back up to the desk together and I said, could you, could you tell us again whether you, you've got a room for tonight? And the guy ran off something and I looked at Jeff and Jeff said, I don't know. <laughs> so I, uh, this is three times and we still didn't have a clue. So I said, well, I'm just gonna make a guess that he said yes, so we'll take him. And he said, okay, fill out the paperwork and off we went. But it was, I think it was one of those, I don't know whether it's Cockney or one of the other regional accents of, of England, they have several of them who were even stronger probably back in the 1960s than they are now. But it was it, it is evidence of how challenging some of that can be, even when you think you're dealing in the same language here. The Loudons had gone back to the United States, married, returned, and there's much more to that story, but it doesn't really fit into our story. 
Uh, but we were seeing, they came back with these this clothing boots and things, so we all were looked sort of the same. And, um, and people were wondering if, in <laughs> fact, we were a part of a cult. <laughs> and um, we... Which was half true. Half, half true. <laughs> half true. Yeah. It came through really quite quickly through um, France and Spain. I spent a little bit more time in Spain than Andorra, but then Morocco. And um, Morocco was, was really our, our sort of introduction to... Um, to what we thought of as the, as the trip. I mean, this is what we really had come for, not so much for Europe. And it was, it was just fascinating, the, the Berber uh, tribal groups and, and the people of the, of the Rif, and it was just, um, we, we really felt that we were in a... Um, this, this is what we went to see here. What we went to see. Yep. And we came into, um, again, Ceuta, um, it's a Spanish enclave in, in North Africa, a free port. So again, had some work done with the, with the Land Rover. And then uh, traveled along the coast and had some interesting um, experiences. One was we were down at the, parked the Land Rover um, above the, um, the dunes and so on. Um, and then went down to the coast, came back. It had been broken into, and we had we had lost some Levi's and shoes and things of this nature, and realized that it probably was someone who needed a change of clothes, <laughs> maybe from prison garb or whatever. But it was it was interesting for us because um, it, it seemed so kind of honest that they didn't take all this incredibly expensive. Equipment that we had, camera equipment, and cameras, kind of thing, and yeah. cape recorders, and and things of this nature, and so we went through here and we found um, some of the vineyards just encrusted in snails and things, and so it was just that things were different, you know, than than one would expect. We got into the mountains mm -hmm. uh, above Algiers. And without realizing that there's a, a Berber counter coup, uh, it, uh, the region had gone through um, tremendous uh, upheavals politically and so on. And there were deep tensions between Morocco and Algeria and so on. But then within Algeria itself, and so Jin and, and, uh, and Will had gone off someplace and, and D and I. Let me just quote, what we'd right. done up in the mountains to kind of camp for the night. We were gonna put our sleeping bags out and camp there, that was the idea. And uh, so then after we stopped, we said, well, let's just, let's light, let's relax a little bit. So Willard, Virginia went out and then, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so a vehicle arrives and mm -hmm. these people get out and they're heavily armed and they have their bullets and and um, their uh, appearance as rugged tribal people with their shish, their sort of garments that are typical of that area. <laughs> and, um, and as I recall, probably scarred and, <laughs> and so on. And anyway, they wanted to know uh, with some urgency, who we were <laughs> and why we were there, mm -hmm. and uh, and we didn't know who they were or why they were there. <laughs> right, <laughs> as far and as we know, they were serious <laughs> bandits. Uh, because we had we knew that there was this counter coup, and we knew that there were shallow graves along the road and this kind of thing, and so they um, uh, sort of Will and Ginny came back. Um, I had thinking that it would be wise to make some sort of personal contact with these people. And so I went around and I shook hands with them and, and so on. And I'm, I'm not sure that that made any real difference, except there was some personal contact. And so they bundled us up in their vehicle and our vehicle and, and so on. And they took us down to an abandoned Roman Catholic church yard and they uh, basically, D would know since mm -hmm. I didn't speak Arabic, 
uh, that you'll be you'll be safe here. And um, we still don't know who they were. I, I, they think that they were government irregulars yeah. or, or something, but they were concerned about once they found out who we were, mm -hmm. uh, with the incredible ambiguity of that, yeah. um, they uh, they just wanted us to be safe. Yeah, they they were genuinely concerned about our welfare up there yeah. and said, you know, this is dangerous up here. You really shouldn't camp here. You should camp down right. in town. And so that's why then they took us downtown. We were we were just fine with that. One other footnote to that story that was kind of uh, humorous. Uh, when they first came up, it was just Jeff and I there, and uh, so they came up and we were the ones talking to them. And so they told us it's dangerous and you should come down there. So, okay, we'll go. So, but we needed to find Willard, Virginia and bring them back so we'd all four go down. So I started hollering out, Willard, Jenny. Nothing. Willard, Jenny. Nothing. And, I, and the thought that was run, running through my mind literally was, jeez, here we are. They've been gotten by the bandits that they're talking about. Here we are only two weeks into the mm -hmm. trip, and we've already lost mm -hmm. two of the four people. <laughs> and I was really worried about it. And then finally they came tooling back here, and they said, oh, yeah, you guys called it. Yeah, yeah, come on, we need to get some things going here. And uh, so it turned out to be not scary at all. In fact, it was comforting <laughs> that they were trying to make sure we were safe. But it really had me worried for a while there how this trip was getting off, what kind of start this trip was getting off to. But also it was somewhat significant that we were traveling with a woman because yeah. we were then seen, I think, as being less threatening. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And it was... Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That's probably true. Yeah. Completed the sort of the northern European part of the trip came quickly um, through France, actually in, in France for only a few days, mm. um, visiting visiting Paris and, and moving southward. A little bit more attention paid to Andorra, uh, because we were um, in England, had outfitted the uh, sort of in a very basic way outfitted the uh, the vehicle in Andorra, which is a free port. Uh, then began to sort of fill it out in terms of jerry cans and and auxiliary fuel tanks and things of this nature, and um, then. Maybe uh, if I could just inter interject yeah. in there, one of the challenging parts of, of that particular segment was once we got the vehicle, then we had to make a lot of strategic decisions with a lot, a lot of unknowns, such as which spare parts should we actually carry with us as opposed to finding on the road if we decide we need them. The more you can carry yourself, the better, but then there's a limit to that. How many jerry cans should we have for water? How many jerry cans should we have for gasoline? Uh, how much food do we think we need to carry at any given time? What's the maximum amount of time we're going to have to do that? Uh, and all these kind of logistics, because we had this long this Land Rover station wagon with four of us in it and space for food and these, but it was limited. I mean, that was our house for 12 months. And so everything we needed had to be in there, but there was only so much space there that we had to accommodate.